Gary Payne and the Sergey Payne of the world decided they know that the conventional mediums have a lot of flaws. Let's remove those flaws. What are the flaws? First of all was that everything was date card based. You see, you know, we will have an auction mechanism of selling advertising. It should not be date card based. Then they said, okay, you know, uh, people cannot be targeted based on intent. We target them based on intent. Third thing they said, okay, measurement is always a problem. We make it just much, much, much more measurable. But when all those things happen, there were a few things that commercial advertising had, which they just actually did not replicate. One of those things was frequency. You could not show the same ad again and again to a user, and because of that, people for remembering your ads was difficult. Second thing, digital at one point time did not have reach, which changed now. And lastly, the most important is that duration of ad exposure wasn't there. Whether it was a banner, whether it was when somebody comes on a text ad, the duration was so minuscule that for you to remember that brand itself was very, very difficult. Now what happened was that the advent of social media frequency came in, where social media allows you to show the same ad again and again through any social media platform because people come there on a regular basis again and again. YouTube changed that duration of ad exposure because now you can actually show TV kind of advertising through the internet and YouTube in a way has become a new TV. A person who's consuming video is actually not relevant whether he's consuming on television or on YouTube because today, and already like, like my television has been connected to internet for the last many years. You want to listen to songs, you want to listen to something, you go there, you search for it, it plays. And I think for my daughter, there is nothing as broadcast television and internet television. For her, it's video, whether she sees it on the television, she sees it on a mobile device or an iPad, for her it's the same. And that's how the views are going to be. For them, the distinction between television and us and, and internet video is going to diffuse as the internet broadband speed becomes really, really fast. They start coming on television and consumers won't know today. Like right now, consumers, <coughs> consumers don't care about uh, music, right? It's a like MP3 or CD is, is not relevant anymore. So I think the approach to brand building, we have a separate white paper, but I think if you want to use digital brand building, I think today you can do it. But the approach has to be radically different than the way you approach it on conventional media. And it's very important to understand. You can't take your conventional advertising and replicate it on digital and you think that brand building will happen. So it's an approach which I can elaborate later on today we on cover search. Similarly, I think digital is very effective for information dissemination. So there are certain platforms that have strength of information dissemination. Whether it's if you just take Twitter or YouTube, these are very, very effective information dissemination platforms. So you may have a group of dealers who want to educate them about something. You may have a group of customers who you have to something before they can actually consume your product or service. These are mediums that can actually help you disseminate the information that you have across a group of people. Same way if you want to do crossing and upselling, then community building is a good option to take. So there are certain platforms like LinkedIn, Google Plus, Facebook have inherent strength over other mediums. And it's very, very important to just, if you take, just understand this slide, if you want to do digitally. Because as soon as you get your business objective mapped, but if you don't map the right digital medium to that business objective, then what will happen is you're not using the true strength of the platform. And, and a lot of people laughed out here when I said Twitter and customer acquisition, but I'm telling you, it's not that one or a million people have asked me this. I have a lot of people, in fact, I've got examples that you know, Dell sells computers through Twitter that Mike can't buy. So, and they give me an example that, you know, $10 million of sales came from Twitter. I say, okay, take your company to $250 billion in sales. And once you reach $250 billion in sales, I'll sell $10 million from Twitter for you. So, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, even though Dell sells through Twitter, what percentage of the sales comes through Twitter? is 0.0001%. Right? It's not the most inherent strength of Twitter to sell products. But it's a very good medium for information assimilation. Very good medium for building a community whom you want to interact with. And that's what the age should be leveraged for. Digital, I think, has gone a little bit beyond just customer acquisition and marketing initiatives. I think it will give you a lot of action insights. So think about it like this, right? Google is the closest man that they've come to creating a mind machine. Right? Every time somebody types something on Google, that's what he's thinking at that moment of time. So imagine that, that you know what the world is thinking because Google shares data with you through these things like Google Traffic Estimator. 
Now, social media has something even more exciting. Social media actually is a data driven actions. What people do, or the people are about to do, they share on social media. So if you know what the world is thinking, and you know what the world is doing, imagine the kind of actionable insights you can get for every single business in this room. You can actually spot trends, what is becoming popular, what is becoming less popular. You can know what the future is going to look like if something has been dumping every year for the last 10 years, then you know that it's going to reach a tipping point in one day, and it's going to become big after that. And all these things are something which a lot of businesses out here can actually tap into. And I'm talking about builder, I say, you know, we have these things, and I was looking at the trends. People searching for building swimming pools and gyms has increased like tenfold or hundredfold in the last 10 years. And now all of us know that that's true. People are looking at buildings now where certain basic facilities are there in the building itself. But Google was telling you that because it was 50, 10 years back, it became 100, it became 500, it became 1000, it became 10,000. When you as a builder started offering that, was when everybody came to know about it. But what if you tap into Google today in your industry, in your business, and see where it is going, what brand is showing up? What if you can take that action one year before the other competitors take it? Where become the obvious? It's like knowing the tsunami is coming a little in advance. That little in advance can give you a huge competitive advantage. Right? So this is a sort of a landscape we draw when we work with our partners. We map every single business objective they have into one of these things and then draw up a strategy for that business objective. We don't say that, okay, you know, we want to use this medium for this way. He said, you tell me what your business objective is, but tell you how the landscape can be plugged in. And this covers almost 80-90% of one more plan with Richard. Um, this is going to be a big workshop. What we do is we skip content, but the purpose of the workshop is just to focus on a few things which are important, but skip the rest. So we are not skipping it because of lack of time. The way we structure the workshop, we will also be giving this presentation across to you guys. So you can go through it in peace. I know 99.9% 99 of the people never look at a presentation which has given us after the workshop. But we cover the majority of it. We will also do a quick audit of uh, four or five of the big websites or any of the guys who will do an audit. We'll tell you that how do you actually optimize your website from search engine point of view. But I think the basics we try to call this workshop. So the broad principles are uh, very relevant to you when you talk to a, even an SEO mentor, he doesn't throw too many jargons at your face. At least the basics should get clear. So I think um, this is a question which probably I should ask 10 years back. Now everybody knows that there is Google, there's organic results and there are paid results. So the job of SEO is to make sure that you rank organically and get free traffic. Now, there are only three to four factors which actually influence SEO. These are broad factors which could be further subdivided into 200 plus factors. Mm -hmm. So, Google did something like uh, 500 changes to Google algorithm last year. But the thing is, Eric Schmidt had said in one of the conferences, he said that it tested 15,000 changes. That means, just imagine, they tested 15,000 changes out of this 500 were implemented. But that's the speed at which these factors, so the, although the base factor of page rank and all the algorithm landing page wrote, uh, that has changed standard even today. That is still the base of what Google does. But there are two other factors where the volume knobs keep adjusting based on which trying to make the user experience better and better. And those are 500 changes in a year. But the three, four key important factors to take care of, everything else will fall into place automatically. You don't have to worry about it. So we take today the 200 factors, four growth factors, and I will put this as the architecture of the website. Can search engines come to your website and get the information they're looking for and you know crawl it, get all the information as quickly as possible? Or there is some roadblocks that you have on your website. If you fail at this first level, then doing SEO is very, very difficult. Second is content. Now what happens is, we've had partners in the past, large enterprise players, who want to rank for a certain keyword, but they don't have the keyword in their website. <laughs> so, but the fact of the matter is, we're laughing out here, but it is tougher, right? So I'll give you this example. Uh, Nokia doesn't want to rank for the keyword mobile phones. They want to rank for the keyword mobile phones, but they want to call their devices as a mobile device. They don't want to call it a phone because they believe that it's much more than a phone, which is true. But the fact of the matter is, 
people don't search for mobile devices, they search for mobile phones. Right? So content on your website is essential. And if you're Nokia, you can probably achieve it. So you can rank for mobile phone without having mobile phone in the content of your website, but most of the SMBs out here, trust me, it's then you have to spend money like a Nokia. If you don't have that much money, then it's better to put that content on your website, an easy way to rank for certain keywords that you want to rank for. Um, authority is something which, uh, I think this happens exactly in real life. This actually distinguishes Google from every other search engine. And this was the start of Google in a way, because what they said was that what you say about yourself is not important. But what other people say about you is more important. Right? See, before I walk in out here, right, what we try to do is, oh, I work with these clients. I have been in the industry for 14 years. Oh, I am now a part of the larger network called iCosmic, which is the world's largest search agency. What am I trying to do out here? I'm trying to create credibility for myself so that you listen to me and what I'm saying is probably true. Right? So it's very important that the authority is brought in before you actually tell the search engine that I'm going to rank for this keyword. If an important guy is linking to you, then you will rank. So it's not about the quantity of links alone. A lot of people say, I've got 50,000 backlinks. But a single backlink from the right source is more than 50,000 backlinks from multiple sources that you've not heard of. Right? Instead of PCS and News Corp, what if I've named 20 clients out here and none of the person in the audience has ever heard of the 20 clients? Right? At the end of the day, you would not build up credibility for me. Just mentioning one client and I do search marketing for data consultancy services is much more credibility than anything else, right? So that's what our solution is worth is that getting the authority from the right source is very, very critical when you're doing SEO. It's not the quantity of things that you get back when I can use the SEO. Lastly, if you added a feature or one of the things that we added now was engagement. Think of it like this set. So search engine's job is to send traffic uh, based on the intent they have to the right place. If search engines realize that where they send them is not the right place, the next time they will not want to send that user to that place again. So if the user comes to your website and goes back to Google and clicks on the next result or organic result, trust me on it, if enough people are doing it, you will never rank for that keyword again. So it's very, very important that we don't fool the user into coming to a location and then realizing, okay, this is not the location I wanted to be in the first place, and come back to Google. But if he goes from there somewhere else, that's fine. If he comes back to Google and searches for something new, that's also fine. So it's not just going back to Google. The biggest thing that you should avoid is he doesn't go back to Google and click the next or any result. I mean, you didn't answer the question. And the second guy has to be clicked to answer that question. So engagement comes there, which is you know pre-click engagement and there's post-click engagement. Pre-click is your CTR. I've had hundreds of examples where people spend hundreds and thousands of hours writing ad copy for pay. And they don't spend even a few hours for writing ad copy for SEO. Let me give you an example. Suppose you were spending 100 rupees on pay. What if your ad copy is very good, you get double the CTR than what you're getting earlier? That means your cost will go up double, go to click on it, you pay more. In SEO, what happens? You get double the CTR on SEO, then you get double the traffic without any additional cost. And plus in both quality scores, in that case, in here, your rank will improve. Let me give you an example. Uh, one of our uh, clients is hdc.com. They had a keyword called uh, EMI calculator. Do you wait for your uh, conversation to get over? Sorry. So uh, basically what happened was that the guy searched for EMI calculator, the pop-up window had been indexed by Google itself. And what would happen is people would come there, they would type the EMI, and from there they would just go away because there was nothing out there a call to action. Or they would come back to Google. What we found was they were ranking number six. And a lot they were wanted to rank for top ten, so they were happy with it. But we went to analytics and we went further. We found that why are people not applying for home loans? Why are people not getting engaged after that? So a lot of times SEO, you stop at the rank. That's a very wrong thing. You should see what happened to the user post that they cost. What we did was very simple two things. 
We added an icon that says apply for home loan and second go to agc.com homepage. First thing that happened was the application for home loans went through the roof because EMI calculation is the last thing, the buying cycle for any user. Second thing what happened was the rank jumped from number six to number five, uh, number six to number three. And the traffic actually tripled with that growth. So they had 500 visitors a month, they became 15,000 visitors a month, one single keyword. I think now they're ranking number two right now for a keyword in my calculator. So that is one change which is not even an SEO change. Based on the analytics data, we just make one change of adding two icons out there. And this is the kind of growth they got in their traffic. So we should not stop SEO. We rank number one. Let me give you another example. We're working on a project for somebody. Nokia was ranking number one for a keyword called mobile uh, gaming phone, mobile gaming phone or gaming phone or something. But they were not getting any sales. What we found was the last year model of the same phone was ranking number one position. So when you click on this, it will take you to the previous model of the phone, not the current model of the phone. So in spite of ranking number one, they were not getting interaction. So very important as SEO, you have to go beyond the click and see what the user doing with after the click and he's not giving you sales, not taking the action that you want you to take, then ranking on SEO is not the problem for you to go and look at the engagement that the user is giving you. And a lot of people miss out on that very, very easily. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, on that EMI calculator bit, you know, what do you have to do to make sure that you remain in the top three? Let's say HDS is in the top two. Now what do you have to keep doing? I mean, do you have to keep working on uh, certain aspects? So I think what my philosophy is, I may be wrong. I think uh, nobody knows exactly how Google captures their dollar from. But I see that a lot of effort that goes in is to get me in the top five positions, top ten positions. A lot of their backlinks and everything to get you there. But I think once you come in the top five positions, the algorithm actually changes. The algorithm gives a lot more value to CDR. I mean, the hundred people are seeing your ad or seeing your SEO result, how many are clicking on it? How many of them going to the website? and spending time out there and not coming back to Google. And even if they're coming back to Google, they're searching something else. So the engagement, CTR, and a lot of other factors which cannot be calculated when you're at number 200 become extremely important when you're in the top three positions. So when you drop from top three positions, it is because maybe your engagement has become what, less than what it used to be earlier. Maybe the CTR is reduced. And these factors now play an important role. So if these 200 factors are there, which are holding knobs, I believe that at different positions, they play a different role. So once you come in the top five positions, then just adding more backlinks now will help you. I would rather put more efforts on customizing the ad copy of SEO and the description diary in such a way that you get more, more clicks and optimize your landing pages that all the information that the user wants, you are able to do that to that information. But again, there is no way to verify this, but we believe that uh, if I were Google, I would do this. Uh, and it just makes sense. Because once you're in the top five positions, that means you've got good SEO. After that, if you're giving engagement to the user, good engagement and good CTR, then you should get rewarded for it. Uh, the question. Uh, you talked about basically the last example was uh, measuring between online and offline. You said basically sales didn't increase, but assuming that's measured offline. So what, was there, like, is there any call to action to measure that or is it just based on trends? You talk about, no, so. Nokia okay, uh, example. Number one, they didn't increase sales. Yeah, so it was an online example. What was happening is you search for a game phone, they're ranking number one on SEO. But they're not getting sales online or any interaction online, they're getting a huge bounce rate. So what was happening was the last year's model, and that would be two models before, was actually ranking for the keyword as number one position. I guess what I was asking in my assumption is Nokia doesn't sell online on your website. Uh, search markets they do. So Nokia may be in 103 markets, in India they don't. This was a global uh, example in any case. But let's take the same example where if I'm basically uh, just giving information on the website and measuring sales outside, if I'm looking at an action as sales, is there basically some, like, we give an example of having links. So see, basically what you do is uh, that wherever you're doing this certain thing, you can find a survey. So if you're not selling online, the time of fine is a survey. If you're not selling online, bounce rate can be a survey. You can see what is the survey you want to find. So if you don't sell, let's say you want to sell cars online, so the test drive is a survey. You're selling both music, music speakers, they're getting that demo in their showroom, the survey. So you're just find a survey that tells you whether what you are doing is it working or not. And the survey can be depending on the industry you're in. 
Then it's irrelevant. I think it's very important to know that the user is telling you what his intent is. Right? When you go to your own landing page, half the time you come to know whether you answer their intent or not. You know, if you just keep this in mind, this is what the user's intent is. Are you answering the intent? If you're answering the intent precisely to the user's satisfaction, then when you go to your landing page, you'll know. If you are, then it works for you. If you're not, it won't work. So I can now go deep into architecture, but I'll just skip most of it. But uh, see, basically what happens is there is something called WPC guidelines. It tells you what are the things that you should take care of when you're structuring a website, the architecture. It should be very easy for uh, searching the project. So all those things now can understand flash to a certain extent and other things, but it just makes the job much more difficult. If you have plain HTML, you have text, one easy way is you take your mouse pointer in your browser, try to copy what you have on your website. If you can copy it and paste it somewhere else, that means some reason can read it. If you can't copy it and send images of that, searching will have it slightly more difficulty reading it. And uh, searching would not waste so much time in trying to understand something, the sense is very, very popular. So although they may have capabilities to understand certain things, but if you make it simplified at our levels, you just get better effective results in Google. So this is how the users see websites. This is how search engines see websites. So it's important that if you sell health insurance, then the first thing saying health insurance is useful thing to have. A lot of time what people do is they put about us as the first thing. And they say products. And they say everything out there is actually thing that people never search for. And then what happens is the search engines don't know the context your website is about. And maybe theoretically you will write for something all about us. So there are 50 million websites out there, they say about us. Right? So the whole purpose is lost. We don't give the search in the context. And this is so often people do this. It is not an uh, uncommon mistake, right? Thing about us, products, etc. on the website. So it's important that we know certain spider information from top to bottom, left to right. So the things that are more important should be on top and giving the search in the right context. The easier to make the job of a search engine is, the more rewards we get out of it. The more difficult we make it, we obviously get better. Uh, site speed is very important. So how, like there are times when I've gone to sites where it takes one or two minutes. The user is not going to wait for two minutes, not a search engine is going to wait for two minutes. So if your site loading up quickly, can have a pretty big impact on your SEO results. If you take content, Again, keywords are the most important thing in the content. So if you are a person who sells, you know, we are discussing with somebody who sells, they sell flowers. Now, if you want to sell flowers which are very expensive, then ranking for a keyword called expensive flowers or expensive bouquet may be a good idea. But ranking for a keyword called flowers is not a good idea. So it's very important that your headline, your title, everything, you know, it may work counterproductively that you know, why would a person such expensive class? But it happens at times, like you know, now I'm part of a multinational, my boss is visiting from Japan or some other place. I want to put a Google group bouquet in my conference room. Now I'm going to start, I say, okay, if I spend 200 rupees on the bouquet, I'm going to be this bouquet, it's worth it. Because he's going to come to India in 10 years. So the fact of the matter is, there may be needs of people who may search for counterintuitive things like expensive class. You know, so it's very, very important to understand the intent, and, and that is what you can actually satisfy. And it's important for your whole site structure for that keyword called expensive class. And that's your definition, and that's your core competency. You can deliver the most expensive bouquets in town. And I'm sure there are hundreds of people who may require it at different times of their life. Uh, I think this is the most important thing that you have to remember. What is the goal of a search engine, right? It has to find the content which is contextually most relevant to the user, user's intent. If your website is not able to do this, then you will not get results. And this is the most important factor a lot of people forget that we, we try to do SEO, which is we try to gain the search engine. Now that's increasingly difficult to do, right? They have $150 billion, they have thousands of engineers trying to prevent exactly that. It's better to go and help them in their endeavor which is to rank you for something that you are relevant for. If you create a relevancy, then it's the job of search engine to actually rank you. So you help them in the endeavor, rather than try to find a loophole of 
or finding out ways that you can thank, right? And we've seen that this 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 process and this uh, uh, strategy always works because then you're working along with the hundred fifty billion dollar gorilla rather than against him, and it's not easy working against a guy who's much bigger than you with much more resources than what you have as a company. One thing that has changed is that, you know, earlier we used to always think of websites. And uh, we used to talk about SEO, which is from website optimization. I think that whole thing is moving to web presence optimization. Because a lot of consumers are now going to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and other different things where they're not spending as much time they used to spend on the website earlier. So what you do is, when you do SEO now, it's important that you create how do you optimize all your digital assets that you rank for everything, even if that content is not on your website. So like for me, for example, we work with ESP Bangalore. What we found was people were searching for mutual fund, but number of people searching for what is mutual fund was four times more than mutual fund itself. So what we did was we created a series of 20 videos that answered the query, what is the mutual fund, what are tax saving schemes, what is the SIP, and these videos we optimized for YouTube. We've got almost 250,000 views for those videos. When you search for a mutual fund globally anywhere, we are ranked number one right now. For tax saving schemes, we actually the top three results. Because what we found was that there are, uh, there are communities which have a lot of investment in the mutual fund sector. So we made the same videos in Gujarati and Hindi. We just dubbed in Gujarati and Hindi. Now what has happened is if you go to YouTube right now and search for tax saving schemes, the first three videos are our videos. One is in Gujarati, one is in Hindi, one is in English. And the total of these videos, again, is come to 40,000 views. This is a very boring financial product. So 40,000 views for this product, obviously, is a lot. And the same clicks cost 80 to 100 rupees a click on Google. So you can import 40,000 into 100 rupees of value. And this click is three minutes of a video. These are the just maybe few minutes on your website. So this is the way for each of our industries, can we think of what people are searching for, who the right target audience for us, can we create content which is non-text, copy videos, copy images, and then can we use the same techniques of SEO, exactly the same techniques, nothing changes, that we rank for that intent. And there is an opportunity, the number of users in India right now are waiting at 120 million. They will become 372 million in the next three years. So all the users who are on internet today, they actually graduate probably from a desktop to, to internet on mobile, etc. The next 400 million users are all going to be, a lot of them are going to come on mobile for the first time. 400 million people in India don't know English. So the growth of regional content, the next few years is going to be phenomenal. Right even in the world. If you can create video content which is regional languages, you can create text content which is regional languages, you can create images which are regionally tagged digital languages kind of keywords, you will get a lot of results. People may not come to your website, but a million people can watch your brand's video on YouTube. As a brand, you should just remember that you want to engage your target audience, whether you engage them on YouTube or website, how is it relevant? It's important that you engage your target audience. So again, this is something which we have to always remember. Search engines are always about intent. You have to answer the intent that person is looking for. You're starting a website in a certain sector, don't try to rank for flowers. It just will take you too much time and go back or try it. Find out what's your niche audience. What is the one guy who's looking for a specific flower combination and you're the only one who can offer the combination effectively because one comes from Washi and one comes from Kerala, then that's the bookie you make and that's the bookie you will rank for because whenever somebody says to that combination of flowers, you're the only person in Bombay who can deliver that combination. Maybe the only five thousand people who search for it. But those five thousand people only buy from you. Because nobody takes the pain of doing that. Right? And you, you can just type those two flowers into Google and tell you how many people are searching for that combination every month. Where it becomes financially viable for you to actually build that combination okay for you yourself or not. Right? So I'm just giving you one example of having uh, a lunch conversation somebody where it suddenly becomes relevant to us. It doesn't matter that you know uh, whether you're large enterprise or not. I think everybody in this room can use and understand how the opinions can be leveraged to get yourself a competitive advantage. So here are things which we go a little bit more detail into when we do a site audit. But very simply, there's a structure in which 
search engine read information. So what happens is that uh, they go to the uh, page title, to narrative description, etc. There was a there was an image out there, right? You should which would be best. Huh? It's an image. It's maximum. Okay. So uh, so these are the three things in authority: age, words, and buzz. Now, age is something that you can't know much about. If your domain name was booked yesterday, these are somebody who booked his domain name 10 years back, he has a distinct advantage over you. Another thing is, it's the same advantage is there in real life. Right? If I'm going to get, uh, um, let's say, an angioplasty done, hopefully not, but I will choose a doctor who's 55 years old, who's got thousands of surgeries in his pocket already, I will not choose a 27 year old medical intern. But what if there is a medical intern? Who's 27 years old, but he's a prodigy and he's uh, operating the Prime Minister of India, then I'm being considered as him. Then I'm a prescribed old doctor. So the age is remaining the same, everything else remaining the same, I will choose a 55 year old doctor. But if something changes, and then the votes and the credibility that he has is much more superior than a normal 30, 55 year old doctor, I may choose him. Right? So I think it's always important that. Everything has remained the same. The site that is older is, is, is earlier in the index of Google, is going to rank higher than you. But if you get the right vote of confidence, then you could rank above it in spite of not being of the right, uh, the same age. Buzz is social media, a lot of mentions. So one of the patterns that Google finds a year, year and a half back was that even if a site is not linking to you, but it mentions your brand name in the site, in its credible site, that value will get transferred to you. So let's say Time Magazine covers your company on its cover page and mentions your brand name out there, mentions the industry you're in, even though it not, doesn't link back to you, the search engines could take that data and give you credibility for that keyword because the company name and that industry was mentioned together on a very, very credible site. And you can't pay to come on the home page of, um, uh, so at least, I hope it's, that you can't pay and come on the home page of Time Magazine. <laughs> I think the credibility of the press is reducing day by day, but hopefully some something in trust. So, A, you can't compete with, but there are other ways to compete on it, which is your bad things. So it's very important that you get a lot of authority coming in, but it's not the quantity of things again. The right link from the right source is worth 50,000 links to the wrong source. And so many times, a lot of people come to me, you know, I've got all these things, my competition has 25 links, I have 25 other links, but they're still ranking ahead of me. And when I look at the link profile, I look at where the links are coming from. They are an Indian company targeting Indian audience, and out of the 50,000, 49,900 links are for some US site. Now, search engines are not stupid, right? They do a link profile and know that these are things which are not genuine links on the user. How the links are placed, what is the architectural link, there are a lot of other factors that are important. Before you just say, okay, I want to buy one link at one rupee and here's 50,000 rupees, give me 50,000 links. Right? This was no looking of any benefit to you. Right? Getting the right link is very, very important. And create content, create things by which you generally use as a link to you. The reason why PSP lack of is linking for those things is because a lot of these videos are picked up by hundreds of thousands of blogs, all linked to the YouTube brand channel of PSP lack of. That's the reason globally is now ranking for a keyword for YouTube fund. It's not even what is mutual fund, it's like a keyword mutual fund itself. And they're getting views more over the world. So social media is now playing a more important role. If a lot of consumers are mentioning about things about you, then there are chances that certain things give it a lot of credibility. So Kathleen Abeda of Google, actually earlier they used to Twitter feed used to come into Google directly. Now the relationship is broken, but social media is becoming an important element, even from I see a point of view. A site or a brand that has a lot of social media mentions for a particular industry will get the benefit on SEO too. So it's not limited to your website alone. Uh, so this is something which we talked about. We made this a separate thing because very few people actually spend time on this. First thing they don't do is they won't see what the user sees when a search when you're ranking number one for your website. If you search for your own brand name, or you search for uh, the category you're in, if you're ranking number one in search engines, so many times you'll be surprised to see what a user actually sees. I've seen users where the, the title of the page is given out there, and then it says copyright. It says do not copy this page, don't do this, don't do that. 
And that's the description that user sees when he sees yourself, when he finds you on a search engine. Now, most people would not want to click on it. So it's very, very important that what user sees is it engaging enough. And the amount of time that we spend on page search, customizing ad copy, we can spend the same amount of time on SEO. The benefit from here will be tremendous, a lot more, and without any additional cost. And we will you have to pay additional cost. And then the second thing is, post click when you go to the page, just see if you want to write for a certain keyword, you know the intent of the keyword, are you answering their answer? If you're giving their intent and if you're answering their intent, then you get traction on the search engine. If you're not answering their intent, you won't get traction. So time on site, bounce rate, action taken. If it's negative, then you're going to get a negative rank. And even if you're ranking well, the rank will drop. And a lot of people don't put in effort out here. I've seen so many brands there, when they start ranking the top five, they're happy. And they just forget about everything and they're after. But just ranking is of no benefit to you. The user has to click on your URL, uh, uh, your, 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 he has to come to your website, and he has to take the action that you want him to take. Only if he takes that action, then SEO can benefit you, right? So it's very, very important to go beyond just ranking for a search engine, making sure that you're getting traction and business from it. And we, and we actually work with brands. The only sure shot way for evaluating value of SEO is that do you get incremental organic traffic? Are you getting incremental organic business? If it's not leading to additional traffic, not leading to additional business, then the ranks that you get are irrelevant. And that's the only way you want to evaluate SEO. If you're investing 100 rupees in SEO, it should give you adequate ROI in terms of additional traffic and additional business. If it doesn't, the SEO is of no value to you. Just the ego satisfaction that you're ranking for a certain keyword in, in the number one position is not good enough. It may serve your vanity for a while, but it's not going to give you a long-term result and sustainable traction. Okay. So, see, nobody knows these factors, but we believe that these are the key things that search engines consider when they align things. So, at least you have a broad base, and this, this graph may change based on the company you talk to, the research post that come on, etc. But broadly speaking, you take credibility, trust is important, uh, anchor text of external links is important, uh, social media is important, posting data is important. If you want to rank for an Indian site, Hosting it in India is better. You know, like in America, hosting it out there is better. So these are certain broad areas. They have each have their own weightages. And these weightages keep on changing every day. But broadly speaking, at least you know that these are things which are important when you are actually optimizing your SEO. So question. Yeah. Like in the television ads, suppose a company a brand invests X amount, and you know, in terms of this ROI, is that increase in sales? Uh, likewise, how does it compare with the digital world? So actually the thing is, very few brands actually measure increasing sales for a television ad. What they measure is TRP. So they actually don't measure additional sales. Here actually you can measure additional sales. Because what happens is you invest 100 rupees, you know how many additional people came to your website, what time is spent, did they fill up an inquiry form, after filling the inquiry form did they buy something from you, all these things are measured and tracked. So you can actually know that what are the investments you made, what result you got out of it. If it's not the e-commerce site, you're not selling from the site. It doesn't matter, because what happens when he comes there, he knows which pages you saw, which pages he saw. If he set up an inquiry, then if you could write the inquiry, this came through an online thing. So think about this, right? The measurement of digital is far, far superior than any other machine we use. So it's very, very direct. Even though the user has not bought something, but what if he came and saw a video? What if he came and saw five pages? What if he went to the page where it says reader address and he went to the Nagpur reader address and then from there he dropped out? That means he got down to the thing where he wanted the reader address of Nagpur and from there he dropped out. Most likely he got the address he was looking for, the phone number he was looking for, he must have called your Nagpur reader, right? So if you actually know the exact history and the path he took before he dropped out to your site, there's 90 percent of the audience are reaching the contact us page or the reader page or location page, etc. Then you know that your website is doing the job of taking them to a place from there, he's getting the phone number of the address, and then from there on he's dropping on and your job is accomplished. And you will also know that this is happening in Kerala, this is not happening in Punjab, it's not happening in Bihar or whatever it is. 
So you hope that your digital is not too much, but okay, now you can go to other places, and then you can actually invest accordingly. So personalized search is something which uh, a lot of us, we go to our own uh, so Google, search for our brand name, search for our specific thing, click on our website, and the more and more time we click on it, the higher and higher rank comes. But the unfortunate part is, it's only in your machine that you are higher ranked. <laughs> Every other machine, you are way down the 10th page. So the thing is, so many times I've talked to brands and say, you know, I'm ranking already number one for all the keywords. And the thing is that <laughs> this is how Google goes to personalized search. It's a very really important role of this, right? And there's some, so many searches for the word eagles. Now, Google does not know the word eagles means that band and go to California. Does it mean the world eagle and something with patriotism for US, or there's New York eagles, which will be a sports team? Google has to identify your past history and know whether what pages you should get. So unfortunately, it doesn't know that you are your brand who is searching for the same, your own website and clicking on it so often. It just sees that, okay, this user, when he searches for this intent, he clicks on this brand, so this brand will be important to him. That's the reason it keeps on bumping up the brand to rank higher and higher. So eventually, if you click on your website enough times, you'll rank number one on your own computer. <laughs> So let me let me burst that bubble that you think that when you're logged in, Google is collecting data. So let me just tell you what are the things Google owns. Google owns a browser called Chrome, Google owns Gmail, Google.com, double click on Android, and uh, uh, let's put this way, Google Plus. And at the end of the day, if you take uh, all these things, these data combined, that can be used for ranking your website. No. So, whether you're logged in or not, uh, Thank you. 